EYC and Ground Expert Consulting. Um, and then this, this will be followed by a plenary discussion on, on challenges and opportunities related to boost upskilling and reskilling through better outreach and guidance services. Um, so to start, I'll like to give the floor to uh, so Sophie Dos uh, Doskarova and Alina uh, 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 Dragas, um, both working in the adult skills team of the European Commission, DG Employment. They will present uh, the EU initiatives to boost upskilling and reskilling with a focus on outreach and guidance services. And I hand over to you. Thank you, thank you, Simon, uh, for the very nice introduction and for setting the scene, already mentioning our adult learning working group and the work on, on life skills. Thank you very much for that. Also, I'm very happy to see the big interest of so many different stakeholders in, in this meeting. So uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for that. Uh, as Simon mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Sofia Dushkarjeva and I work uh, uh, on adult skills in the, in the European Commission. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? And the main topic of my presentation will be the adult skills policies. And uh, we are now actually in a very good moment for uh, for skills policies. There is a increasing policy attention uh, to them. Uh, as you may have heard, the the president of the of the Commission uh, uh, for the Lion announced 2023 as a European year of skills. So there is all eyes now on, on skills and we will be uh, working on uh, matching the needs <coughs> of uh, companies uh, with people's aspirations. That's one of the goals of the European year of skills. Uh, but uh, there are also <coughs> other, other ambitions and ambitious uh, uh, goals and target and and that uh, within the European pillar of social rights action plan which is, which is one of the uh, main policy documents at the European level there was a ambitious goal set that at least 60 percent of all adults should partic participate in training every year by 2030 and this goal was endorsed also by the member state uh, and i because this uh, focus of uh, of this seminar is uh, is mainly on the vulnerable and the hardest to to reach i wanted to highlight that to reach this goal it is very important also to cater to the needs of of the hardest to reach uh, which often have uh, uh, difficult experiences with the initial uh, initial uh, education system and often uh, have lower motivation to participate in in training so we need to really focus also on this target group uh, in order to reach those ambitious targets and and motivate uh, more people in participate for, for participation in in training uh, can we move to the next slide please here I would like to highlight in a nutshell how the Euro uh, European uh, Union and the European Commission supports uh, skills policies. And one is uh, the po setting up the policy framework. As I mentioned, for example, we have the European pillar of, uh, of, of uh, social rights. We have the five year plan for skills, the European skills agenda. And of course, we have also other policies. And uh, for example, in the form of council recommendation, which I will mention later on in my presentation. Another, another important uh, focus is building building partnerships and promoting mutual and peer learning. Building partnerships, you very well know how important is this, is this as you are also involved in the pack for skills. Um, but uh, on top of that, we have also mutual and peer learning uh, activities, for example, to enable uh, the, the member states to share different practices, to learn from each other. We have, as, uh, as Simon already mentioned, we have the working group for adult learning, uh, which is another platform that to exchange on those topics. We have national coordinators for adult learning. So there is variety of, 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 of fora and of course also platforms like the EPALE platform to, to exchange and to work together. Another, another part of, of the work is also evidence and uh, we, we also monitor the progress in form of the European semester, uh, the education and training monitor. We have reports such as the joint employment report and they are also another ad hoc report of, on topics of, of, of interest. 
Another form of uh, support to skills policies is funding, which is of course very important, uh, which is key to, to really progress. And uh, the, uh, the funding is supported uh, at the EU level by uh, by the European Social Fund Plus, uh, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, Technical Support Instrument, but also uh, very, very well known program such as the Erasmus Plus program, which I am sure most of you already know uh, quite uh, quite well. Uh, can we move uh, to the next slide, please? Uh, in this slide, I will already dive in to a important initiative of supporting the, uh, the low skilled and vulnerable adults. This is the Council recommendation on upskilling pathways. And as I mentioned, the main target group is the low-skilled adults, and the objective of this council recommendation is to provide them with opportunity to acquire either uh, basic skills such as literacy, numeracy, and digital competence. Those are very important because they are basis for any further learning, also for participation in society and the labor market. They are really, really key uh, because nowadays, especially in the digital environments, we need them for everything. We need them to book a doctor's appointment. Uh, we need them to to write a CV and to apply for a job. They are really key. Then, of course, uh, this should be targeted to the needs of, 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 the, of the person so they can also progress to develop wider, wider set of skills and or they can be encouraged to progress towards a qualification. And the rationale of this of this initiative of this council recommendation is that it is based on a three steps personalized support which should be integrated into into a integrated pathways. This is also very important. So the three steps are skills assessment. The individuals should have their skills assessed and according to their needs, they should be offered uh, offered uh, a tailored and flexible learning offer, which is the step two. And also the step three is validation and recognition of the skills. They should have their skills validated and they can progress either towards a qualification or they can also have their skills certified uh, and they can then use a certificate, for example, at the, at the labor market to show it to the employer uh, to kind of have a proof uh, of, of, of the skills acquired. As we are today talking also about outreach and guidance, this is also a important, very important element of this initiative because uh, as, as we are talking about a specific target group, they need uh, specific guidance throughout the, the, the whole uh, journey within this upskilling pathways um, and also also, there is the outreach is very important in terms of this target group, target group to inform them of the value of, of learning and to give them the motivation to 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 learn. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, here I would like to talk about a new uh, innovative initiative uh, uh, which was uh, brought uh, up by the by the Commission, but after a very careful consultation with the member states and uh, and the different stakeholders, we had a really wide uh, a wide uh, consultation process. And 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 here because we see that really the, the efforts in skills need to be boosted up. Here we are focusing on to uh, on all working age adults and enabling them to access training, including for professional transition, irrespective of their labor force and professional status. And here the targeting is uh, universal. We are targeting all working age uh, working age adults, but it is possible to give strength and support to the vulnerable groups to who, who need it most. In the center of this initiative is the individual individual learning account, providing training uh, uh, training uh, entitlements uh, to adults. This is the financial support, but we also want to combine the financial support with the non-financial support via the enabling framework, which should boost up the use of those of those training entitlements. Uh, the, uh, the enabling framework com comprises, for example, of a single portal uh, giving uh, good access to the to the training possibilities and uh, kind of informing uh, well uh, well all the individuals about 
the, the possibilities being offered. Another, another part of the enabling framework is the paid training leave, guidance, validation and the registry of the training offer. This is, this is all for, uh, from me in a nutshell. Now I would like to pass the floor to my colleague uh, Aline. Thank you very much, Sophie, uh, and good morning to everybody. I'm uh, very happy to take part in this webinar. Um, I will address in my in the second part of the presentation after Sophie uh, the topic of career guidance um, as being part of so of this um, webinar, and I will do so by drawing upon some of the conclusions of a recent study we have done on career guidance, and then I will finish with some tips. Um, uh, what is important when we talk about outreach and guidance for, in, part in particular in the context of upskilling low qualified or low skilled adults. Um, let me just start by saying that guidance, career guidance or lifelong guidance, we use these terms interchangeably, uh, is a transversal um, key issue, issue and it has underpinned many of the European Union initiatives in the field of employment and social policy. As such, guidance plays a key role, as we just heard from Sophie, in the Council recommendation on individual learning accounts and also in the upskilling pathways um, recommendation. But there are many more examples where guidance plays a crucial role, but I, I don't have enough time to, to quote all, the, all of these. Um, um, so, but since guidance services um, to individuals are, are, are the responsibility of uh, member states, um, I, I, um, I can just talk you through what we have done at the European level, um, at policy level, where we try to monitor developments in the area of lifelong guidance, in the area of policies and practices um, through a study. But I would like to start first with the definition. Next slide, please. Um, so what is actually like career guidance? Um, so you see here a very comprehensive definition, um, which essentially says that um, lifelong guidance or career guidance defines um, processes and activities um, that support individuals to make decisions or informed decisions, choices about their education, training uh, or work um, pathways. So it's a very complete definition which comes from the Council resolution on, on lifelong guidance, which dates back to 2008. So it's quite a while. But I think that this definition is still valid. Um, and as you can see also, um, the, the definition also says that it it, there's a range of activities of individual or collective activities, which is um, included in, in, in this um, lifelong guidance um, approach, uh, which is relating to information advice, um, giving, counseling, competences or skills assessment, support and even go, can go up to teaching of decision making or career management skills. Um, so to find out more really um, what happened actually since 2008, we have uh, therefore launched a study in 2020 and I would like to show this on the next slide please. So, um, and this study was work, was looking at um, guidance policy and practices in the EU, looking at three different um, elements. First of all, looking at what really makes a national guidance system effective. And the researchers, they listed, they have listed or come up with a kind of mapping where they list um, 11 features. I'm not going to bore you with all these 11 features, but it's just to make you understand that um, there is... It's just to, for us to understand how these systems are uh, organized by taking these um, features into consideration. But there is not one lifelong guidance model. There is not one country uh, which has included all these 11 features um, or, or principles. And so it can really vary even among within countries. Uh, let me just give you um, some uh, examples for two uh, of these features. For example, take us, let's take us le legislation. Um, of course, a career guidance system or policy this which wants to be effective needs, of course, inst institutional and organizational ownership. Um, so therefore, you can imagine that legislation is basically a very important feature of such a guidance system. Um, um, and um, I, just to give you an example, uh, I would quote now France um, with the personal learning account, training account, where uh, you have guidance um, provision included, even also validation of non-formal learning. Um, and so that's that's a good 
example, let's say, uh, for this feature. Um, another one for cross-sectoral cooperation, which is mentioned also in the slide. Um, so there we, I would like to just um, give you one example. Um, as you know, guidance, career guidance has this lifelong learning approach. So you have career guidance, which is happening in schools, in vocational education and training, in the public employment services, in the companies, so in adults um, institutions, adult education institutions. So it is very often working in silos. Um, they're not working together. So the ideal case for cross-sectorial cooperation would be if you have a place where all the services needed for individuals would come together. Um, and um, so, for example, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we have uh, here even in Brussels, um, the Cité de Métier, which is such a place um, where you have uh, different stakeholders, organizations that work together uh, to create career services which are open to anyone um, and which are free of charge. So you can go there, you can get information about the different professions, Métier, you can have, make an appointment with a career guidance counselor who would help you further um, to... Um, to get some, you know, to progress in your in your training or learning pathway. So if you um, want to know more about, you know, about these features, about the innovative practices, which are also listed in the study, then I can recommend you to uh, look into the study, which is here listed in the um, in the back on the on the bottom of the page. And I think uh, Felix, you also put it in into the chat. Um, next slide, please. So my last slide is just um, summarizing a little bit, um, you know, to, to come back to the topic of uh, today's uh, workshop. Um, what is important for guidance services um, when they when we want to develop these guidance services for in, in, in the view of upskilling, reskilling, low skilled adults? Well, um, we need to really focus on four um, important um, elements uh, here. And this is also according to research um, by CEDAFOP, which is also listed on the bottom of my slide, which is called Empowering Adults Through Upskilling and Reskilling Pathways. And um, so the CEDAFOP has developed an analytical framework for developing such pathways and they have um, in particular looked at outreach and guidance and so I just regrouped these four points which you see on the slide which which were listed in this um, analytical framework for guidance and outreach so what is really important is of course user centrality um, so that means and I think Sophie has said this already um, when she talked about um, ILA or upskilling pathways that adult learners need to get individualized uh, personalized guidance um, so, and this guidance service should really look at the long-term individual autonomy of the person uh, of the adult so the and individual is really and in, in his needs or her needs are really in the center holistic and adapted services that's the second point very often it's um, you know you need um, these services which are supported by um, interdisciplinary team teams um, because adult learners, especially low qualified adult learners, don't only have problems in finding a job or an, a learning opportunity, but sometimes they have some other issues as well, including financial, housing, integration issues uh, or psychological problems, which need to be sorted out maybe before um, looking really for a job or for um, a learning opportunity. Um, I just give you an example. My last um, my last mission uh, before COVID was actually at a local PES in Poland. And um, I remember very well that the people who work in the public employment service there have said that they really need to go towards the people, reach out to them, go on the supermarket, into the supermarkets, libraries, and sometimes they even have to go to the hospital or the psychological institution where these low-skilled adults are um, being treated. So um, this means you need a very comprehensive um, service for, these, uh, for this target group. Now, identification of target groups is, um, I think it's very clear, and I think we will see this also in the examples which will follow. 
um, users of guidance are really very heterogeneous and career guidance counselors must, must really start with the needs um, of each of the um, groups and the subgroups. If you take, for example, an unemployed person, then you would, um, this group would then crisscross with gender, disability, uh, nationality, immigration, uh, or refugee, refugee status. So this is just to to make you understand how difficult it is actually to how much information you have to really find to really identify very well the target group you are you want to work with and if you want to have an overview of these target groups you can go to the inventory of lifelong guidance systems and practices which is the second link uh, on my last slide here where you can not only see the different systems for guidance um, and outreach uh, per member state, but you see also the, I think, 20 and more ta different target groups they are talking about um, um, in, lifelong, in the area of lifelong guidance. So the, my last point would be multi-channel delivery for access. Um, that's also important because um, information and guidance services need to be provided in a multi-channel uh, way. Um, this means, again, according to the needs of the person in, in, in question, either it can be web, it could be telephone, it could be face-to-face -face meetings, but it needs always to be adapted to the beneficiary, um, the needs of the beneficiaries. So I think I stop here. I think I'm largely over my five minutes. Um, thank you very much um, for your attention. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sophie and uh, Aline for interesting presentations and, and really setting the scene at a European level, but also kind of already presenting some key features of, of, uh, of, of, uh, um, of effective uh, um, approaches to reach out and to organize the guidance systems. I, I don't see any uh, questions in the chat, so also given the, uh, the time, um, I would like to propose to go to the next, um, next se uh, session where we after having set the scene at the European level, we look at ground level initiatives. So I hand over to our first speaker, uh, uh, Katarzyna uh, Udala, uh, project, manage, uh, project manager of Digital Europe. The floor is yours. Thank you, Simon, and um, hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm very excited to be here and uh, discuss with you this particular topic because it's it's something uh, personally very dear to my heart, but that's something also that we cover um, at Digital Europe at work. Um, very briefly, my name is Katarzyna Udawa. Um, I am a project manager at Digital Europe. Digital Europe, to those who, <clears throat> sorry, to those who don't know us, um, we are a Brussels-based leading trade association uh, with advocacy work focused very specifically on digital transformation in a broad manner. So even though we focus a lot on policy work, we also have a very strong team um, dealing with many European projects. Um, and um, a heavy load on these projects are projects on digital skills. Um, one of those was um, a project that uh, I had the privilege to lead on behalf of our organization called Women Fighting. And if we can jump to the next slide or even the, the next one after this. Um, and even the next one from this. So uh, Women for IT um, was a project created with the mission of upskilling um, young women. And of course, the digital sector, the technological sector, as you well know, is uh, still quite male dominated. Um, but on top of focusing on the gender aspects, um, we wanted to be more intentional, more intersectional um, in the way we address these groups. So I was very happy to hear Aline's presentation and the approach that focused uh, indeed on the intersectionality and um, uh, crisscrossing of, of different identities and um, and um, how how people um, exist in our society in their different um, uh, different kind of identities. So this is what we were focused on, and um, we wanted to reach out to young women that were not in employment, education, or training. So the need, um, I we didn't necessarily like to talk about them as vulnerable or disadvantaged, but we do recognize they might not be benefiting from a similar level of privilege. So the idea here was, of course, to um, help close the ICT specialist gap in Europe, um, to boost youth unemployment, well, to boost youth employment, so address youth unemployment. Um, but um, the key aspect was as well to involve women and girls. Well, we were focusing at, um, on the 
age level between 8 and 29, so girls and young women, um, to involve them in digital jobs and ICT professions, and especially focus on those women who were uh, not benefiting from the same level of privilege. Um, we piloted our efforts in Ireland, Greece, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, Romania and Spain, that, though we had um, more partners, one from Belgium and one from Norway. Um, the goal here was to upskill young women, but not necessarily in generic digital skills, but really identify specific job profiles and skills related to those roles and then train them in those specific roles needed in um, in specific countries that we were also addressing. If we can jump to the next slide, please. Right, so um, the entire approach of the project was quite um, intersectional and trying to ensure diversity. And from the very start, we worked a lot with employers. Um, it was um, informing one another and trying to create the process quite in a quite collaborative manner. Uh, we started off with the research. We defined those ACE digital job profiles. Granted, it was in 2018. So now the profiles would probably be different after the post pandemic reality. Um, but um, this is we defined those ACE job profiles in 20. Um, we included some innovative tools. Uh, we employed uh, some um, on top of the actual digital skills training, mentoring sessions, empowerment sessions, soft skills training as well. Um, basically ensuring that um, the project, the entire training process and then employability processes are as inclusive as possible. So, for example, the curricula that were designed were designed in a way that would facilitate participation from um, from all sorts of women with different individual needs, with um, a different uh, time flexibility or being able to, to commute or not. So all of that was taken into consideration uh, when designing the curricula. That's very briefly about this because I'm also trying to be mindful of time. Um, can we jump to the next slide? These are the eight job profiles that I've mentioned before. So that ranged from anything between data protection officer to junior web developer to project coordinator, data analyst, but also something more creative like a graphic designer or digital media specialist. So these were the roles that we were focusing on back when we were piloting. But now I think the recommendation would be to change these profiles a little as well. Um, if we can jump to the next slide, please. Altogether, we trained over 900 women in our piloting efforts. That was between the 2021 and 2022. So you can see that it overlapped quite some with also the lockdowns. Um, and we were very happy to see that um, out of these more than eight and 900 women, more than 700 were then employed in the digital sector or decided to pursue either solopreneurship, was, which was very cool uh, for us to experience as well, um, or pursue further education Education in um, digital skills and digital um, upskilling altogether. Um, if we can jump to the next one, then. So um, a couple of factors that we focused on when designing the whole project, not only curricula, uh, but um, the outreach, the educational offer, um, everything that we put forward to involve these young women. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, it was creating an educational offer that is accessible. Then we focused on um, appropriate messaging uh, and then we wanted to diversify our outreach channels. If we may jump into the next slide on accessible education alpha. Um, here it was uh, from several aspects. So very often what we can see in European projects is that or upskilling projects is that we do a lot of the work in English. Um, the programs are available in English. Uh, the collaboration is done in English and this happens as well, of course, in this project. But everything that we created was also nationalized. It was localized. So we ensured that uh, first of all, the uh, training that we offer is relevant for the national realities, um, but also delivered in the national language. So that already took out the barrier of, well, maybe I'm not really able to participate in English. Maybe this language is not something that I can maintain and manage, but in my own language, I will be able to pursue this. 
Um, then uh, I put here a, a hybrid format, but of course the first piloting during the lockdowns we did online. And this actually really facilitated the fact that um, many of the young women, because normally we would probably run the um, the projects in the piloting in very specific cities, so not everyone would be able to join. But uh, we know from our partner countries that were piloting that because of the online format, we had many participants from rural areas, so they were able to access the, um, uh, the training as well. And another part was that we wanted to make sure that, um, for example, creating assignments or handing in um, uh, different tasks, uh, making sure that the tests are being done. All these exercises were flexible enough to accommodate for, for example, commuting or imagine um, a young mother, you know, like she has, of course, responsibilities and maybe she doesn't have enough support, so she would have to juggle uh, different things. So we wanted to make sure that the completion of the training is as simple and as supported by us as only possible. Um, and that also came together with the accommodation of uh, their personal needs, uh, providing mentorship support. So whatever they also struggled with throughout the training, be it the content, be, be it something else in their personal lives, they could rely on the mentor in the project for support. If we can jump to the next one. Um, the messaging that we focus on, because very often we can hear in the projects um, and in the pan-European narrative that yes, you know, um, we there is not enough women in tech. We need more women. Uh, we have um, our digital decade targets, and I think that's fantastic because we need to be aware of this data. But very often we create a narrative of um, we need more women, and this is what we also tell women. So what we wanted to focus on very strongly is to um, empower them to create messages that are inspiring to make sure that they feel supported through how we address them and um, feel like they can also do it, that uh, the digital career, the tech career is something for them, that it's not reserved to, for example, just men or someone with more privilege, but they too can be part of this. And we wanted to also make sure that they see people like themselves uh, via our you know, the communications, different ways of communications already. Uh, but we wanted to show the role models that are out there, be it, you know, high level achieved women in tech, but also, you know, everyday women that have already been working in the sector uh, and are enjoying this, uh, this kind of career um, and understand the benefits of it. And the last slide, I promise. So I'm, I'm trying to wrap it up under 10. Um, and then when it comes to our outreach channels, of course, especially considering the lockdowns, uh, we were somewhat limited and we had to focus on um, uh, on the online outreach first. Um, so a lot of our activities were done uh, via social media um, and uh, different types of content. But again, even though we have our channels that are in English, our website that's in English, all of the partners also localize that messaging. So all of the information that was put out there to women or to other stakeholders was both in English, but the national languages to remove that barrier. Something that was extremely relevant as well for us was um, creating meaningful um, partnerships with key stakeholders uh, at both the pan-European level, but also very much localized. Um, and here we had the privilege of working with um, employment agencies, um, youth centers, um, uh, who else? Um, I know that uh, some of the partners worked also with the local government to make sure that we create partnerships and discuss different channels, how we can reach uh, the people. And we were sharing our networks with one another to be able to address the needs as much as possible and reach uh, the young women that uh, we maybe couldn't reach through our own channel. So establishing these partnerships to multiply uh, the effects. And then what we found effective is once we enrolled the first um, cohort for the programs, it was much easier to um, to then involve other women because of the word of mouth. So once the, the pilot proved effective for the first time around, the recruitment for the next phases uh, was much, much simpler. Uh, and that's also something to consider for asking, you know, and sharing and um, basically involving 
young women that were in our project to become ambassadors of the project and spread the word further. Um, and that's something that really, really worked for us. I will stop here because I've run out of time, but if you have any other questions at any point um, or like right now, I mean, after the presentations, but if you're also curious, you can reach out uh, to myself either via email or via LinkedIn. Feel free to connect and I'm happy to discuss the project a bit more. Thanks, uh, Katrina, for a very interesting and insightful presentation. Um, have looking at this particular target group um, uh, and also kind of listing uh, or kind of referring to many of the um, outreach strategies or kind of elements that that also from the European Commission side were already mentioned had a holistic approach communication outreach etc guidance so thanks a lot um, I won't take questions now but uh, leave the questions uh, after the two other presentations uh, so I hand over now to uh, Adelina Dagomir, uh, Head of Entrepreneurship and, and uh, Employability of Associate uh, GIYC, if I pronounce that right. Adelina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simon. And no worries, I can uh, give you a hand with the pronunciation. It's actually Jake, and it comes from the group of the European News for Change. Um, my name is Adelina. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and have the opportunity to share some good practices from Romania into reaching vulnerable young adults. If we can go to the next slide, please. Awesome. So today I'm going to try to tell you a bit about uh, Jake, our overall approach to reach these uh, difficult to reach young adults and a couple of the initiatives that uh, are Jake original and that have worked uh, that have proved to be effective in reaching them. If we can go to the next slide, please. Jake is a Romanian NGO uh, that started over 13 years ago and that has been activated uh, at the European level for more than 10 years. Our mission is to empower young people to create a positive change in their community. Uh, we have a community, an online community in Romania of over 7,000 active members. I think it's one of the largest at this point. Uh, it's comprised both of um, young people and their stakeholders. So teachers, uh, university teacher, university professors, um, youth workers, trainers, facilitators, all came together under one umbrella, the J community. We tackle four areas of activities. We have a democracy and human rights department, a digital one, a sustainability one, and the one I'm the head of, that's the entrepreneurship and employability department. To all of these, we offer uh, specifically cater oppor catered opportunities to youngsters, young people, teachers, and youth workers throughout Romania and Europe. If we can go to the next slide, please. Our overall approach that is relevant for the, um, the scope of this meeting is the one uh, that to reach difficult uh, to reach young adults. So our approach is comprised out of three steps. The first one is informing. We realize that in order to reach these target groups, we cannot remain digital. Up until a few years ago, I would say six or five, our community was only digital and our activities were mostly digital with our trainers and facilitators traveling throughout Europe to share their expertise. But we have realized that in order to reach the most vulnerable target groups in Romania, for us, the best approach was to go to the most vulnerable target groups. So we have local and national raising awareness events uh, through which we go and inform them about European opportunities, inform them about our original opportunities, and basically get in touch with vulnerable communities and try to make an impact at the um, grassroots level first and afterwards go to a national level. The second step is forming. We deliver local, national, international upskilling and reskilling events. And I'm gonna present to you in the further steps uh, with some original formats that uh, we found work best for a Romanian context. And then keeping them engaged long term. Um, we did this by the J, through the J community, which is used to offer them opportunities even after they uh, have taken part in one of our specifically designed uh, programs. So if they join the J, the J community, they will um, 
get communication, promotions, dissemination, basically, about every opportunity Jake offers. These are almost a thousand a year, so our members come in contact with over a thousand European and national opportunities a year. We're going a bit into the specific activities we're doing. If we can go to the next slide, please. So we're going into the regional youth caravans. I told you that uh, we found that the best practice for us was to go to our target group, to be on the field and within their communities for this. We designed, um, we designed a design, we designed a format of series of local raising awareness events that are delivered in each of the eight social, social economical areas of Romania. Uh, these have over 300 participants for each event. They last about four hours and they have involved moderators, speakers, uh, people in the community that can ask questions and ask for guidance. Um, this is the first type of events. We also have a national event after, <clears throat> so in a year, this eight socio-economical areas are covered. And afterwards, at the end of the year, we gather everyone together, everyone that's interested together, maybe in a large city in Romania, either Bucharest or Timisoara or Cluj, where we have a strong university center or a strong uh, entrepreneurship or upskilling center. And um, we basically facilitate networking. Next, sli next slide, please. The second initiatives that uh, work very well at the European level and Romanian, and we transfer them to the Romanian level, are the European fellowships. Uh, up until now, we have delivered uh, five editions of European fellowships. First one was the European Fellowship on Youth Leadership, afterwards on sustainable development, on human resources, and on project management. The last one being another one of European um, Fellowship in Youth Leadership. These had over 100 participants, um, have um, uh, been run for over five years, and have a very specific a very specific structure. They have a mixed learning experience. So uh, we take uh, the participants through a boot camp. Afterwards, we offer the opportunity to go through a job shadowing, either with our team or with our European partners. Uh, put whatever they learned into practice into specifically designed activities at the national level and then have them um, do some sort of a inspiration of a dissemination of what they found out and implement everything they have learned in their communities. So this would be the first type of activity that works for us. It works really well at the, Euro at the Romanian level because it's developed and uh, delivered. Um, I see a question, European Fellowship, who funds them? Jake does. <laughs> They are only called European uh, fellowships because we offer um, opportunities to work with our European partners. Some of them are um, funded by the Erasmus Plus program. Some of them are funded by other programs, but mostly national and mostly JIC. Okay, going to the next slide, please. Smarter Academy is another, uh, another flagship initiative. Um, it's a mix of uh, training, workshops, and coaching, at the end of which um, participants have a chance to present their project in front of a jury and win a prize uh, from our sponsors or um, a prize that helps them with different European opportunities in the future through Jake. It had four editions, it had three editions so far, social media, project management, and one edition that was focusing on the online presence, the one with digital marketing um, um, and promotion in general of a business. Next slide, please. In order to be able to reach um, young adults throughout Romania, we figured we needed to reach these, their stakeholders. The first initiative uh, that was aiming to do that is the network that we started, edu.jake.ro, that uh, right now has contributors in over 150 schools and universities throughout Romania, 100 cities. And we have with us over 300 teachers that are disseminating our activities and uh, our results in their universities or schools. Next slide, please. 
the international trainings. We are uh, an Erasmus Plus accredited or, uh, organization. Our team is formed um, mostly from international trainers and facilitators that are experts in their fields. We are partnering with over 200 European organizations in order to be able to send our young adults to learn in uh, different places and from tr different experts. And we offer over a thousand uh, yearly opportunities to our community. And next slide, please. And we're talking now about uh, the future plans uh, because I told you that we felt the need to go into the communities. We are trying to start a um, um, NGO network of um, civil society actors, not necessarily, and not only NGOs, informal groups as well. Um, this is called OMG. It's gonna be the organization Mentoring for Growth and it's gonna be on our, an organization, um, a network where Jake is trying to put together mostly civil society actors, but schools also, to help them promote themselves and be better known in their communities. And afterwards to partner with them to be able to better reach the um, uh, young people in their areas. Next slide, please. These were our um, our practices that work best in Romania. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Uh, I would also be happy to offer any input if you have any ideas for future projects. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Adelina, for sharing your experiences and interesting insights in in what works in in Romania to reach out to 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 young adults. I think it's very interesting that we kind of have different target groups in our in our set of presentations. Um, without further ado, I hand over to Nadia Nicolaou, uh, head of proposal writing at Grand Expert Consulting. Um, uh, Nadia, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me. I think it's an honor that we received the invitation to speak at this event. Um, so. Uh, I'm Naya Nicolaou. Indeed, I work as a proposal writer at Grand Expert Consulting. Uh, so that means that I'm not actually the one implementing these projects on the ground, uh, but I have a, a good overview of the activities that we do as a company. Uh, Grand Expert Consulting is based in Cyprus. It has uh, 14 years of experience in implementing EU projects. Most of them are funded by the Erasmus Plus program, but also Horizon Europe. Uh, digital Europe and Creative Europe. Our priority is in providing training workshops and awareness uh, raising activities to young people, focusing on enhancing their entrepreneurial skills, soft skills, leadership skills and digital skills. And in the interest of time, I'll jump uh, to the presentation now. Uh, I thought I'll give you two examples of two relevant projects that are currently ongoing uh, so that you can understand a little bit uh, what we do in Cyprus. The first one is called Is We, and it focuses on entrepreneurial education for creative uh, self-employment of women. Next slide, that's OK. Um, following the COVID-19 pan pandemic, immigrant women experience a double discrimination in the workplace and they have now less chances to find employment with limited access to entrepreneurial and technological trainings. Next slide, please. And the objective of ISWI is to uh, contribute to the restart of the cultural and creative fields by encouraging self-entrepreneurship of migrant women in the sector, increasing their employability with tools that strengthen digital and entrepreneurial skills, aiming at their self-employment business creation. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I'll just mention the outputs of this project, uh, starting from the digital and entrepreneurial skills for immigrant women through a training course of 12 modules, focusing specifically on low-skilled migrant women. Next slide, please. Another output is the Digi and Entra Toolkit for adult educators. And finally, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is the website and where you can find more information about this project. But just to give you more insights, uh, the pilots of this project are, are already completed 
And basically what we experienced is that it was difficult for us to reach this specific target group. Firstly, because we were looking for women with a migrant background and an interest in entrepreneurship. Uh, especially in Cyprus, it's really hard to find this target group because it's already a very small island and these people are very marginalized. The same difficulties, though, were faced by the other participating countries, including Spain and Italy and Hungary. What we think is very important in these projects when it comes to these target groups is to take into account their real needs and challenges that they face. These women seem to be very engaged in the pilots and they were actually very interested in the topics we discussed. The same women even joined events of other projects that we are running, such as a two day event focusing on their career acceleration, including improvement of CVs, interview skills, etc. However, what we think is a real challenge is the fact that they don't actually get the chance to learn more after these workshops or to utilize their gain knowledge and skills afterwards. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the second project I wanted to present is called Artsy Relief, and it focuses on the entrepreneurial empowerment for artists, cultural and creative professionals. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, the culture and creative professionals constitute one of the most affected sectors by the COVID-19 pandemic. And the cultivation of entrepreneurial attitudes, the upgrade of the role of innovation in business, the orientation towards digitalization with presence on the Internet can really support these culture and creative professionals to be prepared for the post pandemic era. And the aim of our project was to cultivate the entrepreneurial and business mindset of culture and creative professionals in order to survive through the crisis and prepare them for new conditions, supporting their sustainable development by fostering innovation, collaboration, digital, digitalization, and also resilience. Uh, one of the intellectual outputs uh, was a report, including the research findings that uh, uh, there is sorry, the research findings for the identification and mapping of their training needs and the definition of the desired learning outcomes, as well as the appropriate training methodologies. Next slide, please. And the main uh, result of this project is a course uh, composed of several modules focusing on the uh, I'm sorry, focusing on the entrepreneurial and digital skills that they can acquire to be prepared for the new era following the, the pandemic. Finally, uh, the final output of this project is an e-learning and collaboration platform, which is user friendly. It contains the interactive online training material and it's connected with a virtual community platform. Finding people to participate in the pilots of this project was actually much easier, at least in Cyprus, because artists and culture and creative individuals in Cyprus in general are very interested in uh, gaining entrepreneurial skills and, and enhancing their entrepreneurial mindset in general. And therefore, they're always searching for such trainings and also mentoring. They were very engaged in the pilots and also our dissemination events that took part in this project. And also, they were very active in the communication challenge that was created via Slack. Uh, so it seems that these people are very much in need of such trainings and also additional sources of inf information, collaboration, news and opportunities. And this actually was the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to present the projects. And if you have any questions, you can email me or send them by the chat. Uh, thanks, Inaya, for, for sharing your presentation and insights from, from different projects you, you are running uh, in Cyprus, but in, in, in Europe as well, of course. Um, I already see that in the chat there's a lot of exchange on information, uh, sharing of websites, um, uh, contacts, so that's really good. I was wondering whether there are any um, questions to the presenters. I didn't find that many. I saw one question from Pepe. Uh, I'm not sure for whom that is, but uh, do you have any practical guidance to effectively train industrial masters? 
Um, it's not a specific question to one of the of the presenters, but maybe if you have any any thoughts about uh, practical guidance um, uh, for this this group, industrial masters, but how to work with industries as well, um, please uh, take take the floor and um, yeah, uh, present what you what you know about this topic. If if not, then I might have a question for. The three of our speakers actually um, what we see is that uh, we discuss a lot of kind of project work uh, and what we also learned from other um, other workshops and PLAs and is that um, in order to to kind of to kind of um, reach out to, to vulnerable groups you need sustainable sustainable and long-term perspectives um, and you need sustainable funding and large partnerships and reaching out to kind of different different types of stakeholders. So I was wondering within your projects, how do you kind of uh, work with kind of um, sustainability in terms of kind of trying to kind of sustain the approaches after the projects have finalized? How are the approaches mainstreamed? May I um, give the floor first to um, um, uh, to Kater Katerina to to say a few words about how you do that with um, on, on your projects? There we go. I'm unmuted now. Uh, thank you, Simon, for this question. I, I think you're touching upon something extremely important. Uh, we implement these projects as um, a pilot activity, uh, but then it's so important to maintain it. And uh, that comes together with a strong network of uh, stakeholders that are committed. Um, and that's something that we aspire to do with uh, all of our activities. Um, a part of that is Women for IT, of course, but other projects as well, um, is very much about uh, reaching out to stakeholders from um, the entire scene. So we're talking about, um, of course, as I mentioned, Women for IT, for example, um, the employees lawyers who have been very much engaged, so the industry itself, um, but also political actors. So we're talking the European level, um, the European Commission, European Parliament, um, all institutions, but also getting the buy in from um, the national governments or the local governments so that we have um, the interest from the kind of policy making side to change or create programs that would be more sustainable. So there's a lot of awareness raising activities. We also work with civil society organizations mm -hmm. to ensure that they also get involved um, and they help us maintain the results. So it's a lot about creating multi-stakeholder collaboration. Um, what else can I say on this? Um, multi-stakeholder collaboration and then pretty much getting the buy-in and ensuring that that funding that we pour is, um, it doesn't stop, you know, because we have the project happening, let's say for four years and then the funding stops. And it's great that we were able to implement it for four years, but then what do we do next? So for example, in the case of Women for IT, we uh, created a lot of outputs that now can live on without um, our participation. So we piloted the actions, we tested them out, we fine tuned them. Uh, and now all the curricula that we create, the methodology, it's all available for also other collaborators, other stakeholders to take and implement by themselves. But that of course requires that initial buy-in and the willingness um, to do that. Uh, so it's very much about creating also sustainable structure um, and having the the outputs and the methodology, because things can be updated, they can be changed, but creating something that is everlasting and then can be adapted based on the needs in different uh, environments, right? It can be local, it can be national, uh, but it can, has to be something that is amendable. So that's how we try to approach it as much as possible and really raise awareness. No, do something that make that creates impact is relevant, and if people, organizations will want to use it further on. Something that is future oriented, not only for right now. Thank you, um, uh, Adelina. Any any additional thoughts from your side on this topic on sustain sustainability and funding? 
I'm going to be on the same page uh, with Katarina on this one, but also add that with our um, original formats, we're trying to find a balance between what funding we have available and the area of the funding. For example, we have Erasmus Plus, Key Action 2, Key Action 3 projects. They uh, they are more into intercultural communication um, or social entrepreneurship. And we're trying to find a balance between our community's needs at that exact moment and the funding we have. And then we adapt our original formats. As you saw, the European fellowships are on youth leadership, on sustainable development, on project management. So whatever funding we have available, we're trying to pour it into the original formats and adapt it. Uh, so we basically uh, always have some, some uh, ideas to plug from our community and then mostly always have some funding to put them into action. This and partner with um, local companies or uh, European level and even world level stakeholders. We have partnered with google.org before to implement some uh, upskilling activities in Romania with ISD UK to have some research that would then take to some activities. So we're we're trying to be the liaison, basically, between mm -hmm. the needs of our community and all the stakeholders. Thank you. Then, uh, finally, Naya, can you say a few words about this topic as well? I agree with uh, both speakers, to be honest. Uh, we are all in the same line. We always uh, have some kind of EU funding to sustain our activities. And as Katarina said, we also run these training uh, activities as pilots via EU funded projects. And what we afterwards do is keep updating them, uh, keep improving them, and we keep adapting them to the needs of the community. And we take the successful ones and take them a step further, let's say, by providing them on an annual basis. And we mostly do this either via collaboration with local universities or via funding from the Human Research Development Authority of Cyprus. So we basically try to sustain them either via national uh, funds afterwards or uh, with collaboration with local authorities and universities. Thank you, Naya. I see some uh, um, questions uh, emerging in the, um, in the chat. I'll first go to the question of uh, Karin uh, Druda Kuhn, and that's a question for Sophie and Aline. We've just finished a Erasmus Plus project on the digital validation of soft skills of volunteers ga uh, gained in si uh, crisis, and this uh, includes as well certification. Um, are there any specific actions for upskilling volunteers and getting them into employment in the pact for skills during the EU uh, year of skills? So it's basically an information question. Um, uh, Sophie, Aline, can I give the floor to you to respond to that? Thank you very much for this question and for uh, for this question and the interest in the European Year of uh, Skills. Um, of course, during the European Year of Skills, it will, there will be possibilities to showcase the different examples. Uh, we are also encouraging uh, different stakeholders to take part in the European Year of uh, Skills and uh, showcase uh, what what they are doing. Um, you can I will then search for the website of the European Year of Skills and put it. Uh, to the chat, uh, there will be also a map of events which will, which will be uh, taking place uh, during the year. So there will be really opportunity to showcase the, the different examples. Um, I also encourage to to check uh, other 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 existing uh, uh, fora and and websites uh, such as uh, EPALEP because uh, those will be also contributing to the to the European Year of uh, Skills and there is also a possibility to showcase the different examples and for the projects to uh, get in touch with each other. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Another question is um, is a question uh, of uh, Vika Trell. Um, are there any upskilling projects addressing to adults of more mature age uh, enjoying higher uh, and enjoying higher education? So have we in the presentations we we focused on 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 young adults, on on young young women, but there for sure uh, are also kind of a lot of projects. As, as from my own knowledge, I know that there are quite a number of projects focusing on on more mature adults as well. Uh, if you can give any example from the three uh, panelists, but also in the chat, if other participants have examples, please please put them in the chat as well. But the panel can react to that question as well, maybe. 
Who can I give the floor? Ah, hey, Adelina? Yes, of yes. course. Go ahead. Um, I do have an example from our previous experience. We have had a collaboration with Latin America before, for example. So it's not a national context, but the world context. And we have tried to reskill and upskill women that were trying to come back to their jobs after their maternity leave. So they were, um, most of our participants, I think they were over 25, even over 30 in very remote areas of Brazil and Peru. And they were trying to reskill and upskill to come back uh, to the um, work market, basically to their jobs or even find another job. So yeah, in some, some initiatives we are working with adults, but uh, mostly Jake is focusing on, on young adults. Okay. Um, yeah, I already see in the chat some some responses to to uh, to, to those questions and providing um, a good uh, websites and um, uh, interesting kind of um, uh, references to projects. So it's really really nice to kind of see that the chat is really kind of a resource in its in its own right. So it's really helpful to kind of collect that and uh, um, put that together. Um, I see another question as well uh, about um, to all three of you. Do you have examples? It's a question from Felix. Do you have examples of how your programs change the lives of the targeted individuals? So can you give a concrete examples of, of anecdotal evidence that that it really kind of put them on a learning uh, journey or that they found a job or that they changed careers? Or if you can give a all one, one example, that would be really illustrative, I, I suppose. So. May I start with uh, Naya? Sure. Um, I don't have one specific person in mind, to be honest, but uh, several women come to my mind that stay connected, especially with our managing director, who is also a mentor in most of our training uh, activities. So they, they stay in touch with her and uh, they keep us posted about the job that they manage to get. But also, I think the most striking examples are women who come back to us with a project idea and they collaborate with us afterwards in writing a proposal actually for European funding. And then they start their own uh, NGO or business and they implement projects themselves as well. All right, um, uh, Katarzyna. There we go. Um, yes, I mean, we have so many examples. I was uh, privileged enough to have conversations with uh, some of our trainees and hearing their stories and their testimonials. Uh, there are two that I remember very specifically for different reasons. Um, one of our uh, trainees uh, based in Ireland, uh, she actually came from Brazil um, and she did have a degree, but it wasn't really very well recognized. Um, and so she decided to pursue the data analyst um, training, uh, training the, the program. Um, and during that time, she got so invested in um, uh, in this topic and she started you know, thinking, like, what, if, what about data security? How does that work? And she started pursuing from this relatively junior and I don't want to say basic, but like early level training. Uh, she started pursuing cybersecurity and now she works as a cybersecurity expert. So that's very exciting. And then another lady from uh, Latvia who pursued a more creative. So um, I think it was a graphic designer and digital media um, combination. Uh, and she ended up joining um, the team for Paralympics. And she actually went off to with the team, with the sports team to do their social media um, and some um, activities around that. So uh, we could see that there was a lot of impact happening. And these are two stories out of mm -hmm. more than 900 and each of them are singular. Of course. Uh, Adelina, any, any examples from your side? On I do have two quick examples. So one of the um, people that has taken a fellowship in human uh, resources is now a part of the global new hire experience team at Microsoft. And I have more examples about um, uh, the fellows going to large firms, but I do have my own example as I was a part of the first uh, generation of European Fellowship in Youth Leadership. And I stayed with the NGO sector full time afterwards. So I guess um, people can fall in love with everything they learn when they have mentors and coaches that are dedicated and when they have the opportunity to learn it. 
thank you. Maybe then uh, an opposite question. In, instead of looking at the impact of those that you reached, are there specific target groups uh, uh, that you tried to reach, but you still didn't manage? So were there any challenges in, in reaching out to specific groups? And what challenges did, did you, uh, uh, yeah, did you come across? Can I give the floor to Naya or? Yeah. Um, well, I think the first target group that comes to my mind is um, ac the academic staff at higher education institutes. Uh, I think they're more reluctant in attending trainings or workshops, but also because of several reasons. For example, they're busy career uh, and the many, many things that they have to do at universities already. Uh, so it's probably difficult for them to attend more trainings in order to either uh, gain business skills or to advance their careers in general. I, I know that this is a completely different target from the ones we've been discussing, but um, this is the one group that came to my mind that we had most difficulties with. <laughs> uh, Adelena, any any other groups that you find particularly difficult to reach out to? Yes, this is actually a very sensitive uh, subject for me because in the past four years I've been managing um, European projects that are trying to reach refugees and migrants in Romania. And it's so difficult to penetrate their groups because we don't have a lot of... Um, a lot of people from the target group in our team, so we cannot enter their really enclosed uh, enclosed groups. But right now, I'm managing a project that's called Raise and is trying to use an AI tool in order to upskill and reskill the refugees and migrants in Romania and throughout Europe. And um, I think we're making progress. I think when the years go by, we're making progress. We started uh, relating with certain members of their communities, and now they're acting as informal leaders and uh, helping us get to our target group. So we started finding a solution. And Katarzyna, maybe an example from your, your side? If you're still there. Katarzyna, are you still there? I'm, I think the connection is a little bit um, blocked. Go ahead if, you, if you're there. Yes, I'm back. I'm sorry, it's uh, just disappeared for a moment. <laughs> Great timing. Um, I would definitely have to echo what has been said already by Adelina, especially. Um, that's not having a representative from the, those target groups definitely um, keeps it not problematic but far more difficult to reach specific audiences and that's why we mentioned this collaboration with the different stakeholders who do have this um, uh, these contacts and established relationships already um, something that i'm thinking of more specifically is uh, we relied heavily on um, technology in the first place um, you know social media online communications especially during the lockdown um, but that also, to a certain way, um, makes it difficult to reach to those communities that are more disenfranchised and maybe don't have um, access to, to these technologies on a daily basis. Um, so that's something also to consider how to go. And we think, you know, that uh, we have technology, we all have social media, we're out there, especially young people, but that's not necessarily always the case. So. It's a little bit also about going beyond that technology and looking uh, at different channels. That's a, that's a good point indeed. Eh? Technology helps, but you need to kind of have your already a, a, some kind of foot between between the door in a way to kind of uh, reach out. And I think the point was made uh, early as well that these use of ambassadors or people that that are from the target groups that kind of provide this uh, uh, this foothold in in your in your target group is a very important um, important aspect. Um, maybe another question is, um, can, you, can you say a little bit more about kind of partnerships uh, as well uh, with kind of education providers, uh, VAT organizations, uh, higher education institutions that that might function sometimes as anchoring institutions in, in a field uh, to provide training, but they can't do it alone. They need to have partnerships with NGOs, with, with uh, civil society, etc. Can you say a few more words about how, how you kind of uh, cooperate with 
with different types of organizations, including uh, education providers. Uh, maybe Adelena, can you go first? For sure, for sure. I'm going to refer here to our edu.jig.row network, first and foremost, because we have um, we are partnering with both um, um, universities and VTs um, type of educational institutions. and we put them together so we offer opportunities basically we have around 300 teachers and professors that are part of the network they receive uh weekly bi-weekly um information about all the opportunities that uh, exist for them within the j community and the j framework basically and um they give us in return access to their students and to the people that are interacting with. That means if we need to be in universities to reach the target group from there, like young adults, young students, to offer them a training opportunity, the teachers are going to be able to be the, the glue between Jake and the students. So they have been especially helpful for us. But uh, on top of that, we're trying to partner. I told you about the um, OMG network. We're trying to partner with other NGOs in Romania because we have found that being um, being performant individually is less effective than being uh, performant in a group. And we, we are trying to reach out to other NGOs. But the context here is, it's a bit difficult because everybody is trying to shine their own light individually. So we're trying to overcome that mentality and uh, and act as a group for the sake of our community. Okay, uh, Katarzyna, any any thoughts from your side on this topic of cooperation with with yeah education sector providers? Indeed, um, we do it a bit differently across different projects. Uh, so for Women for IT, we were a consortium of uh, organizations, partners that focus more on digital um, transformation as a whole and run different projects. And at the national level, we cooperated with training providers uh, that deliver the training that we have designed. So that was the kind of partnership at the national level. In different projects, we include universities in our um, in our consortia and together uh, we design these um, educational programs um, and then uh, very often us as a brussels based uh, association will also um, support with dissemination of these educational um, uh, educational creations educational offers um, and try to translate them also in a less academic um, sort of language because that also sometimes creates uh, a big barrier creating the technology in an academic setting. And okay. to trans and translate it into something simpler. All right, thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Uh, Nigel, can you say uh, also a few words about this? Yeah, we also work differently for each project. Um, but for example, at local level, we collaborate very closely with a couple of uh, private universities who are also trying to incorporate more, let's say, innovative approaches, such as delivering courses by industry experts and not only by um, academic staff. So we have established these collaborations. And as Adelina said earlier, they also give us access to students who want to participate in our trainings. And at the same time, we provide them with new training material and new approaches and new collaborations also outside uh, Cyprus. And uh, also at European level, we, uh, depending again on the subject of the project, we try to collaborate with um, European associations that are mostly Brussels based so that we can also increase our access to uh, uh, to our target group by getting access to their members, basically, and boosting up our dissemination outreach. Thank you. Um, maybe as a final question, um, I would like to pose to to the Commission to I think that Aline is, uh, is has left now, but Sophia, you're still there, right? Sophie? Yes, I am still there uh, and oh, happy perfect. to answer. Uh, no, I was just wondering, yeah, the, the, the whole emphasis on, on uh, individual learning accounts, but also kind of holistic approaches, providing guidance systems. Where do you see this kind of emerging in countries? Do you see already developments uh, going into this direction? Um, and what do you, uh, in, in the slipstream of, of that, do you see any 
uh, that countries raise challenges in this or uh, in, in implementing those systems because it it means quite quite some quite some reforms um, uh, to put this uh, to put this in place. So maybe if you can share some reflections from your what you hear around uh, in in Brussels uh, uh, and speaking with member states, that would be uh, very nice. Uh, I just I thank you for the for this question, and uh, I just wanted to say that we are not starting from scratch. Of course, uh, uh, we uh, countries have different measures already in place. Uh, sometimes it's different type of measures and not the ILA type measures. However, uh, they are already interesting uh, interesting developments uh, uh, emerging, um, and. Uh, also to draw from the good examples which are already existing, like we have in France, how uh, how we have in the Netherlands, we are also drawing uh, examples, for example, from Singapore, uh, who who also has a good system uh, in place. Um, so so there is uh, what to build on, and and also this year we will be starting a comprehensive mutual learning program uh, for countries to develop the individual learning accounts, and and uh, uh, this is really uh, a kind uh, kind of intensive mutual learning program where we ha will have uh, uh, several several events. But the countries will also work in between and they will be supported by country and thematic experts. So we will also be discussing uh, uh, different elements of the individual learning accounts, because as I explained in the initial presentation, uh, there is uh, the element of the account, but also the enabling framework. So we will be we will be discussing all of those elements and and uh, and also discussing how to set up uh, this uh, system the system and we will be really uh, supported by a high level expertise and uh, during this mutual learning we will enable uh, this exchange on the topics we will have also some some discussion papers but we will also enable discussion in in country uh, in country teams to really bring together the different stakeholders because that's that's for us mm -hmm. very very important we will bring ministries of education ministries of labor uh, we will bring the different providers the social partners so we already at, at those events we aim to create uh, this kind of partnerships which they can which the countries then they really can draw on in the implementation at the national level and in the work uh, which which uh, which they will be doing. Um, also, there are some countries which applied for the technical support uh, instrument, and they will be also supported by this technical expertise via via this program. So there are uh, different uh, support mechanisms uh, in place. Uh, so uh, the work the work on that is embarking, and we are very happy to see the interest uh, from the countries uh, to go on this way. Because really, in 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 the current challenges, uh, the digital green transition and the changing labour markets, we really need to step up the work on skills. Thanks, Sophie, and and for making this last point as well. And it, it's really needed. We started with that, but it's uh, it's definitely uh, to reach the sixty percent. We reach all and. Um, we are kind of in rounding off to this meeting now, but um, I think one thing that I found interesting is that uh, we talked about kind of low skilled, which I always find a bit of a not so nice term, actually. Um, I think we need to acknowledge that we all can face some some form of vulnerability, a skills deficit at one point point in, in life and that we need to have systems that can accommodate everyone to overcome those those uh, skills deficits and we don't know what the future the future holds in terms of skills so we can all face those challenges and i think what comes clear for, uh, what comes out of this meeting and from other meetings as well is that we need kind of holistic systems and i think that's also the plea from the commission with the i lab but also upskilling pathways there are in many countries, there's fragment, fragmentation of systems. There's training provision, there are some outreach activities, there are some guidance, there's some financing, but how do we bring that all together? I think that's a very uh, critical point, and that requires vision and 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 broad partnerships and close collaboration between, between partners that might not easily work together or come from completely different uh, backgrounds. I think that's an important one, and and I think it's also a, a clear uh, signal from from the presenters is that we need to work with the, the target groups themselves. We need to find ambassadors, affinity groups, uh, organizations that work closely, that have a a trust in in the organization, of a, a trust in the, uh, among the target groups, which is really important. Um, so these were a few of those of the takeaways I take from from this meeting. Um, then to round off. Um, 
this is not the end of this discussion. Uh, it's not the start, but it's also not the end. Um, and as we are in the, uh, the European Year of Skills, there's a wide range of activities. I think we can have a slide on that, actually. So if we can put that up, um, that would be great. Um, there's a, a wide range of activities uh, being organized to, to engage in discussions um, around skills development and showcase existing initiatives and actions at EU, national and regional and local level. So there's a dedicated website that allows you to learn more um, about the year of skills, uh, including uh, an interactive uh, events map where you can register skill related activities. I think there were already some aspects or events mentioned in, in the chat, so please go there and, and, and uh, put, it, put your, put your uh, event there as well. Um, uh, you can also download the communication toolkit to help you prepare for communication activities, events and media relations. And uh, the launch event of the European Skills uh, Year of Skills is scheduled to take place uh, online in, in May uh, and more information will be shared uh, as soon as possible. There are also some further uh, dates for your diary in this in this slide. So the networking event on the 25th of May and also a knowledge hub in uh, April, uh, which focuses on key funding opportunities for upskilling and reskilling at EU level. I also saw some uh, requests in the chat for uh, to more information about funding opportunities. So um, please go there and uh, uh, look at what, what's there. Um, then the last slide is um, uh, is is kind of is look yeah present some kind of uh, useful resources for you to take a look. Um, uh, there are a number of tools that are available on the Pact for Skills website that can be useful for for your work. Uh, there's a database and search tool for funding opportunities uh, where you can easily kind of find um, uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, funding opportunities and and uh, look for for partners. Um, and there's also, um, and this tool is re regularly updated with new calls, so don't don't forget to check it uh, once in a while. Uh, and also, there's the online library for the Pact for Skills, where there are a lot of resources on upskilling, reskilling, and skills anticipation. And this is also regularly updated. So also there, please take a look. So before closing the webinar, I encourage you also to join the uh, LinkedIn group on the Pact for Skills and complete the uh, feedback survey for this webinar that allows us to, to learn from, from kind of the presentation and from kind of the, uh, the, the, the setup of this webinar. Um, and also, uh, as a final note, I would like to thank the speakers and participation for your, your interesting uh, contributions and also insightful kind of comments and reflections in the chat. And I wish you all the best in working together towards boosting upskilling and reskilling for adults. So thank you. Thanks a lot and uh, have a nice day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.